We are back. We're back. Had a little break there. Yeah. Uh, so today, um, just part of the Money 101 course that I would like to develop or have resources for, because yeah. obviously school doesn't teach you anything about money. Um, today, I got Mr. Murphy in just to talk about money psychology. It was one of the things that he had expressed interest in. Mm -hmm. So I guess first we could kind of discuss just what does that even mean? Yeah, that's a good question. Do you want do you want to start? Uh, sure. I guess, and I mean, I'll start by saying I don't really have any formal, you know, background in finance and stuff, but mm -hmm. do a lot of reading about it because you know it's important. And I, I guess, in my mind, I think about money psychology is like how you think about money, you know, your relationship with money, spending, saving, how you and not just I want it. And yeah, I want a lot of it. Right, That's exactly. That's what people think. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because, you know, you, you do have a relationship with money. Whether you're conscious about it or not, you do. And so how you think about it and... You know, whether you're in charge of your money or your money's kind of in charge of you. I don't know. I guess that's kind of how I think about psychology and money. There's a book out there. I've heard it's really good and I skimmed through it, but it's called Your Money or Your Life. Have you read that? No. Okay. Um, they talk about a lot of the things you just mentioned. So, you know, how do you think about money? Is it something that's finite? You can never get enough of? Right. You know, do you think money is out there? You just have yes. to figure out ways to get it. Yes. You know, when you have the money, then what do you do? you you know like if for anyone who's seen the hobbit you yeah. know are you like the dwarf king who <laughs> you know sits on this hoard of gold yes until it rots his brain and a, and a dragon comes and takes it from him right? yeah because you're always afraid of losing it <laughs> which you know if you want to look at the symbolism of money and wealth i remember i had a discussion with someone that well what came first the dragon or the madness right you know people say oh like he had a lot of money and then a dragon came because he had a lot of money. It's like, well, was he insane to begin with? Like, yeah. why was he sitting on this big pile of cord? Yes. So that's a really good uh, kind of, you, you see this imagery of what money can do to a particular person and group For of sure. people. Another one is a story from the Bible. Uh, or, have you heard of the the story the, the the men with the talents three talents yeah yes. okay so just to narrate this story there's three men and they're given a talent and so a talent is an amount of gold that would co cover one year's wages so let's just say for now average wage for an individual is sixty thousand dollars so these three men are given sixty thousand dollars and the person who gives this money to them says that he'll come back in a year yeah right and just, yeah just but the money is theirs, more or less. Yeah. So he comes back after a year, and one person, he asks the first person, hey, so what did you do with my talent? Like, what did you do with this investment? And the man responds, uh, you know, he, he invested in certain areas, and now he's 10 times his wealth. So now he has $600,000. It's like, oh, that's amazing. Like, well done. The second person he asks, Similar story, except he wasn't nearly, let's say, as ambitious or productive or efficient, whatever, maybe not as lucky. He says, well, I took my 60000 and I multiplied it by five. So he has 300000 The third person, and, and, you know, again, the guy's very happy. He's like, well done. Huh. The third person, he says, hey, you know, I was a little miserly, so I took my $60,000, I buried it, and I have it still, like right. $60,000. I didn't spend it, I didn't lose it, but I didn't make any more of it. And the person who gave the money is actually quite upset by this. He's like, what do you mean you did nothing with this money? You just buried it? I might as yeah. well have, you know, he's quite upset. And then he essentially says, and does, he, he, he takes the money and he gives it to the guy who 10 times his money. And so there's another story in there of, you know, if people ask the question, oh, if I won the lottery, like, this is what I do. And what do they usually say? I'd go on vacation and never work again, blah, blah, sure. blah, right? Um, and so understanding like, okay, if I had a sum of money, what would I do with it? And mm -hmm. how would I possibly invest it? Like, right. Whether it's in myself, whether it's in other people, uh, it, to make it more. Or like, in yourself, you, yeah. Yeah, right? Like, yeah. what are you going to do with this fortune if it happens to fall on your lap? Yeah. And as of late, you know, my thoughts on, on, on this subject are that, <clears throat> you know, if you're 
working full time and you're making a decent wage, but you're still struggling with money. Even if you won the lottery, like $10 million, you will eventually find yourself right back to where you were 100%. because of your habits, the way you think about money, your relationship with money, you know, so it boils down to it's like money's not your problem. No. Like you are your problem, the way you think of I spending. Think so too. And I've heard, I've heard a thing that was kind of, that uh, made the point, you know, like money's just going to make you more of what you already are. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So if you're the, if you're a spender, you know, more money isn't going to solve your money problems. You're just going to be, you're just going to have more to spend. And you're going to spend and it on you more know expensive I mean? things. Yeah. Right? And if you're, if you're already happy, like money's, or if, if you're not happy, money's not going to make you happy. It's just going to compound what you already are. I thought that was kind of interesting because you see it true in lots of cases where you see people win the lottery and they're kind of unhappy for it. It's like, it can be just become miserable. Because it just causes all these other problems. Exactly, right? Like the problem of, you know, all of a sudden, all those people, people you thought were your friends and, and you thought you knew them. Have you seen Have you seen The Dark Knight? Yeah. Okay, so there's a, there's a scene that's very similar to this. The Joker, he's in prison and he tells the police officer, he's like, hey, you know, people in their last moments really reveal who they are. Right. And he asks the guys, like, do you want to know which of your friends were cowards? Right. right. Which really bothers the guy. Money would be similar. Like if yeah. ten million dollars fall into your lap, it's like you're gonna learn who that person is really quickly. Yeah. And I remember I had, had had this discussion some time ago, but just for the sake of not knowing that, I would say no to the money. Yeah. Like I, I really wouldn't want to see how ugly things could get. Yeah. You know, which maybe that's ignorance. Maybe that's me trying to live blissfully. But <laughs> no, I feel kind of the same way. I don't buy lottery tickets for that. And the same reason is because I, I don't know, for me, it's like, I, I do, I worry about what would happen if it fell into your lap and not like I couldn't do it, you know, the extra cash, like, yeah. okay, sure. Yeah. It happens, it's it happens, yeah. you know what? But, but like, yeah, I just, I do worry because you do have all those other problems that, you know, all that extra money brings. And especially I sometimes worry about like, if it did just fall in your lap, which is a little bit different than. Like in the example of, you know, the, the Bible story with the talents and like, if you earned it, I feel like that, I don't know, you might have a different relationship, a different money psychology than if it was just mm -hmm. added to you. Okay. We had to pause for a little moment there, but just continuing where you were, um, a lot of people on YouTube are wealthy, you know, they, who are, who created their wealth. Yes. They talk about the problems of, you know, if the wealth just falls onto your lap. As controversial as this guy is, you know, I, I watched one of his videos on this topic, Andrew Tate. I don't know if you've heard of him. I've heard of him. I don't okay. have him. So. There's a video of him out there talking about like, okay, so let's say you hit it big with some random crypto coin. You hit a pump and you, now you're, you have like 20, 40, 50 million dollars. You know, he lists all the problems with that. It's like, okay, so you never had to work for it you, you right. have no idea how to replicate that right. you have no knowledge of of that system you know you just got lucky now you're just a target yes. like you know and if you're a guy it's like okay you're women are gonna all of a sudden start taking an interest in you yeah and you might not learn soon enough that it's not because all of a sudden you're this attractive guy right, right? That, you know you've developed your character over the last decade it's, it's like oh well, this guy has like 50 million dollars like okay right. he can he can do things um scam artists are going to come for you whatever it is yeah. family's going to come for you. you have no idea what it takes yeah and you're going to have all these like investment people banging on your door and like telling you mm -hmm. you know that they're going to make you your next 50 million if you don't know if you don't understand yeah you could sign yourself up for a lot of a lot of hurt mm -hmm. and so coming back to that point that your money psychology and your habits with money they'll bring you right back to where you were, even if you had a hundred million, 50 exactly. million, I, I think. And that's very well documented with mm -hmm. lottery winners. Yeah. It's like, you know, getting $50 million isn't going to solve your problem. Another thing is what well, you mentioned about, you know, happiness, you know, a lot of people think, and listen, we should, we should explicitly state, like, if you don't have enough money yet, you're going to suffer. Right? Yes. Like if you're, but you need a certain standard of, you know, a certain amount of money to achieve a certain standard of living in which you, know, you meet your needs. But once your bills are paid, your needs are taken care of, you know, it's very interesting what money does later on. And 
as many wealthy people who, let's say, could, you know, honest criticism could be our more materialistic, will say, well, yeah. it gives you more access to things. Yes. And, you know, that's certainly true, but I think it was Seneca who said, or, or Socrates, one of them said that uh, wealthy is the man who wants little. Right. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's complicated. Like, if your mental health psychology isn't sorted out, mm -hmm. like, more money won't make you any happier. It won't make you any more satisfied with your life. No. Uh, in fact, you might find it to be the, the hot iron rod that you're holding on to and wondering, like, why yes. are all these problems in my life? Yes. Oh, because I won't let go of this need to make more money. Yes. Right? Um, I remember seeing a video. This this guy was interviewing a billionaire, and he said, "Hey, you know, do you have any regrets about making your fortune?" He talked about how, you know, his wife divorced him because he was never around, uh, right. and so he has no act, no real connection or access to his children. Yeah, and you know, money can't buy you that family. No, that's right? it. That's no. what I mean. And like, no amount of money. If you found yourself there with all this money, but you've lost all those things that matter to you, or maybe you didn't realize at the time, but really do matter. Yeah, you can't buy that mm -hmm. stuff. And so, you know, like, what is the money for? Like, is it to create more time in your life? You know, because if you use it to create more time, you know, like maybe you get some help and you hire help to go and do the things so that you create more time for the things that bring you joy. Great. Like, let's say being able to pay for renovation. Absolutely. Like, hey, we're going to go away for a week. Right. We're going to come back. The house is done. Right. You're not spending your time doing that. Or you hire somebody to help clean your house. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that, okay, now you're creating time so that you're not doing those things. And now you can... Or alleviating stress with the house right. cleaning. Right. Sure. Exactly. But in a lot of cases, that's probably not what it is. No. You're just like you're, you're, you're not creating, you're not <laughs> using the money to create the time that brings you joy. You're just spending that time trying to accumulate more wealth. Or hedonistically. Right? Or whatever. Like, right. Exactly. You know, how many people... And we can talk about your past career as well and your time working on yes. construction companies. But so I work with the city of Edmonton for a summer. And, you know, these guys are working labor jobs. They're not fun jobs, very repetitive. And talking about like, oh, I got all my toys, right? My, like, I remember this one particular guy who didn't seem to be living a life that, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to live the life. Yeah. Um, but I believe he you know, had a child who's likely paying child support payments, mm -hmm. talked about like, oh, you know, I have my Toyota Tacoma and it's like, it's all upgraded and blah, blah, blah. We got to make payments on that. Got to work overtime, got to do this and that. And I have this other truck as well. And this other thing. And it's like, you know what? Like, listen, I, I mean, I like Toyota Tacoma. It's sure. a beautiful truck. Yeah, I love one. Um, but then I always come down to, it's like, okay, do I want to pay, you know, $500 a month, every month for the next multiple years? to be able to drive this Toyota Coma. Yes. Not really. Now, am I willing to be patient and say, okay, like, you know, I'll just keep chipping away, put money on the side, whatever, put money in investments, keep investing in myself, figure out other you know, avenues of income. Yes. And sure, like one day I'll buy a Toyota yeah. Tacoma. And I'm sure the day after I'll realize, it's like, yeah, I'm still who I am. It's just a vehicle. Yeah, it's, it's, not a, car. it's just a car. You know? You know, I think so too. I honestly, I really think that's one thing that does not get talked about enough is like the saving aspect of money management, mm -hmm. because I think there's so much focus that gets put on how much money you make and how you're investing it. And you know what? Those things are important. But like, again, I don't think it matters how much you're making. If you make 200 grand a year and you're spending 300 grand a year on your house and cars and stuff, then you're living a life you can't afford. Yeah. You know, I don't care how much you make. Like mm -hmm. if you make, if you're spending more than you make, you have a problem. I don't care what the numbers are. And I think that's one thing that often gets overlooked is, is or not just not talked about enough is how much you're saving. Because if you're making $50,000, then you shouldn't be spending more than $50,000. In fact, you probably shouldn't be spending more than $40,000 so that you can, you know, live like you're, making less than you do and live on that mm -hmm. and if that's your budget if that's what you give yourself to spend you know then um you just save those other problems because you know there's a book i don't know if you ever heard of it like uh, the richest man in babylon i've heard of this Have guy. I don't think it's I've like this it. it's this really old it's quite an old book but it is basically both this guy living in babylon at the time when you know, it's at the peak of its um, glory. 
glory yeah and so there's just you know and he meets this really wealthy man this guy that has no money and feeling really down and having a hard time making ends meet and supporting his family and meets this wealthy man who kind of like teaches him these lessons about money and and if and you know like one of the first ones is you got to pay yourself first and the lessons are just like they're just timeless but it's you got to pay yourself first and he says you like always have to set aside 10 percent of whatever it is you make off the top and you put that and then, you, and then the next thing is, okay, you know, what do you do with that 10%? You go and invest it and whatever so that it grows, you know, like have your money work for you, uh, have money be your servant. And then you being a servant to your money is kind of one of the other right. lessons. Or, or use that 10% and go buy a course that teaches you exactly. a skill that makes you money. Exactly. And right? that 10% could be, you could be investing in something that you know about, or it could be investing in yourself. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Go invest in yourself and buy a course. But the first thing is you got to set that money aside. And then whatever you have left, the point was... If that's how much you give yourself to spend, you'll make it work. Yeah, and that might mean that you can't afford a five hundred or a you know five hundred dollar payment on a car every month, and it might mean that you. But that if that's the case, that just means you can't afford it. That's okay for right now, and then you live within your means now, so that one day, you know what, you you will have the means to do that. Like you say, one day you'll be able to buy the truck, and at that point, you might decide you don't want to because you might have a different relationship with money, but. Or with cars as well, or, or with status games. Or a house, right? or whatever. Whatever it is. Or, or, yeah, whatever it is. Uh, one thing with money psychology, people don't really consider, or I guess just the short-termness of our you know, culture right now. It's like, okay, well, I want this thing now. Um, so, so there are many ways to, I guess, break that down. So one thing my friend Trent always tells me, it's like, uh, I remember when I, was, when I first started riding motorcycles, you know, I had no gear other than a helmet. Do not do that. <laughs> buy gloves. Okay, buy 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 That's leather, good right? That's good um, and you know, yeah, for a while, I sure. had been hot over buying like a leather jacket because they're expensive, yes. right? And the motorcycle ones can sometimes be even more expensive. Yes. But then there's one day after a while of living with Trent and talking about investing into myself, you know, I, I met uh, Westman and Mall and they have a store there, boutique of leather, and mm-hmm. you know, jackets were on sale, and it was like three hundred bucks for a pretty nice bison leather jacket yeah and i was like you know what i'm just gonna buy this i'm gonna make this investment in myself because god forbid if i ever fall yeah like i have friends who've fallen and scraped on pavement it is not fun right and they're banged up for weeks if not right. months right because even if you're going 40 and you slide across pavement and yeah. it grates at your skin it's gonna take weeks months for that to heal so yeah. like, what's that worth yeah it's like yeah. do i want like, you know what like 300 bucks <laughs> The biggest question that he would ask with that that helped me change my mindset of investing into myself with them. So, you know, thinking about how you invest was, you know, can you make that money back? And I think Tim Ferriss is on that same note. So it's like, okay, $300 for a jacket that could save me a lot of physical harm. Right. When am I going to make $300 back? Okay, over two days of work. Okay. Oh, this is a no brainer. Yeah. Now, you can't do that every day, right? You can't yes. buy a $300 item purchase every single day because then you're just spending way over your means. But yeah. when you're investing into yourself, right? So now, like, I haven't bought a lot of books in a very long time, but I spent easily $2,000 yeah. on different books. Yeah. You know, something could be said about the type of books I bought. Like, I bought a lot of books that relate more to my interests. So, a lot on, uh, like, history, historical right. things. Um and a lot about nutrition and relationships as well. And, you know, sure, it's not a Stephen Covey book talking about your seven habits or whatever, like leadership and all that. But they were investments into the profession that I've chosen. Absolutely. And another money psychology thing, you know, pooling resources together. So the fact that I live with my friend Trent, I have access to his library and he spent thousands of dollars on leadership books that I'm now going through and looking yes. at and, and books like he, he bought a lot of books on farming and regenerative farming and soil, which, right. which is like to me at the time it was like, why are you reading about dirt? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like he had a book called uh, why you should eat dirt or something like that. I was like, come on, Trent, we're not in kindergarten anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah. Which is funny because now I'm learning all about regenerative right. farming and, and I know there. his mentors. So, that shift into taking the dollars you earn and spending it on yourself because you are your greatest asset. Exactly. Right? Like yeah. students will tell me, oh, Mr. Kawaja, like what should I put my, what stock should I invest in? It's like, well, how much money you got? Oh, I got $50. Like, 
None. Invest right. in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Go, yes. go like buy a book, right? Yes. Read something that educates you, that changes your perspective, yes. right? Absolutely. So my friend Trent, you know, he, what he would say is like, <clears throat> cause I asked him, I was like, why do you buy all these books? The library is free. And he's like, well, did you buy, look at them as lottery tickets. Now, I don't know which one's going to be the jackpot, but am I willing to spend 10, 20, 30 bucks? Yeah. Sure. If I get one idea that can make me a little bit better right. over the course of my life, how much money is that going to get back? Absolutely. Right? Those just accumulate. And, you know, books aren't for everyone. Like reading takes time and energy and it's tough. But, you know, are you going online to buy a course? Right. right? Exactly. To listen to a professor or a professional talk about how they marketed their business, how they fixed their marriage, how, yes. they, how they went from, you know, being dateless to having an awesome relationship and a yeah. successful dating life, how they healed their body, whatever it is, right? Yes. A lot of people, when they think of money, they're just really focused on, uh, well, I need a lot of money right now because I want to do things. Yeah. But not so much the long-term game of, you know, how do I increase the amount of money I'll make over the course of my life? Yes. Because you're likely going to work, even if you're rich. Like, rich people work. They yeah. work They they work probably harder than you and I. Yeah. I, I you're going to do something with your time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, exactly. I think that's that's a great point, is that if you, it doesn't matter how much money you have, you're still doing something with your day. Mm -hmm. And so, what are you spending that time doing, you know? And it better be something that you enjoy, because otherwise... It's a long time to spend. Yeah, I don't care how much money you've got. 20, 30, 40 years in a career you don't like. Yes. So I, I think that's much good advice to invest in yourself first. And that's not to say you can't go buy the car and you can't go buy those other items. But to me, it's it's more of a, if you've saved up, you know, if you're sending money aside and you save up and now you got the money to go buy the car, I think there's more joy in that than, you know, owing on a car like i'm not a big debt fan i mean there's good debts and, and bad debt but like you know you've got to know that by putting money into a car that, that's not an investment you know what i mean yeah. like you're because yeah. it's just going to lose you money and that's okay as long as you're okay with that and you and you know you can afford it mm -hmm. but especially if it's a commuter vehicle right if you buy some 1965 collector's edition right. thing and okay. it's going to sit in the garage very different but yes. most people aren't mostly. thinking about that right like, that's like joe rogan jay leno money who have yeah. like a, a fleet of collectible cars right? right very different right yes they also have too much money to know what to do with right exactly but, you know if you're just the if you're just a standard average regular person you know buying a brand new vehicle yeah is a tremendous amount of debt it locks you into a a money payment cycle which makes sure that you continue working so if you're so one thing we could shift that discussion to is how our expenses generate stress yeah so if every month you need to pay off thirty five hundred dollars worth of everything whatever it is well, the one month you don't make $3,500 is going to be very stressful, yeah. right? And if you do that a second time and a third time, you know, that stress builds. And that stress can give you a heart attack. Yeah. You know, it can shorten your lifespan. It can reduce your sleep. It can really turn things to the negative. Yeah. That, you know, most people don't realize, right? Uh, and with the whole doing something, working, you know, there is this perception, I would imagine, in our society that, like, well, rich people just exploited poor people and that's how they're rich and they don't work. If he, those are all the rich people, you know, those are pretty, pretty bad people. Yeah, you got to find, right? like, like, find some different people to hang out with. You know, I think of a guy like Patrick Bet David who has a podcast, a couple companies, you know, he, maybe his net worth like a hundred million. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt that that man works a lot. Yeah. Um, and it seems like he only takes vacation for a few weeks out of the year. Right. And so it's like, okay, you have a hundred mil, but what are you doing? He ain't partying and uh, blah, 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 doing whatever. Now, that doesn't mean that when he goes out for dinner on an evening with friends that it's not a luxurious meal. Right. But what makes that meal worth it? Yeah. The fact that he's buying a, let's say, $200, $300 steak or the people he's with. Right. Because my friends and I, my two Brazilian friends, like, you know, just about every Saturday for the last two, three years, we have dinner together. We go over to Save On Foods. We buy like a $25 packet of steaks. Right. Get some rice, you know, maybe get some ice cream on occasion. Yeah. And chill, we have a good time, right? We just hang out. 
that would not be any different if the stakes were a hundred dollars right for right? sure yeah you know <laughs> and That's so this perception that like oh when i'm rich i'll just be able to sip pina coladas on the beach and not have to work it's like well where did that money come from yeah right and if it came from a legitimate source how do you expect it to just keep generating revenue right unless you've figured out you've invested in yourself you figured out the knowledge you need to have that right yes. so, so maybe you did get very wealthy a few million dollars whatever it is and you put it into the stock market into stocks that pay you uh, dividends and so now you know your dividends provide you let's say three to ten thousand dollars a month and yeah. you choose like okay you know what i know i was a millionaire but i'm gonna live a new life where i spend less right because i don't want to have to work i just want my investments to help me live yeah that's kind of what my friend trent does but his lifestyle is very different to mine you know he he most of his money is spent on high quality food because of his uh, autoimmune issues. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of his money is spent on just investing into different projects and curiosities, but realizing that he's not for him, his own life. Like he's not interested in a flashy car in a big right. home. He's not interested in playing a, it's a phrase I'd use, but I'm not going to use it on here. A, a, a measuring contest of, yeah. of sorts yeah. with other people sure. that he doesn't know. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, because and, if that's what it is, if that's what you're trying to do is create this persona about yourself, about, you know, that you've got all these luxurious things, then you have to ask yourself why that is. Like, And then are you willing to do the work to maintain that? Right. right. Like if you want to drive a nice BMW, live in a mansion, waterfront property, whatever, you want, you know, the nicest clothes as soon as they come out and whatever, you want to fly vacation three, four times a year. Man, that stuff's not free. No. And it ain't cheap. No. You know? And uh, one thing, like, as I've gotten older, my money psychology has changed. So um, my friends and I, like, so I'm going to go to California in the summer mm -hmm. for maybe five or six days. So the first money psychology thing is why am I hemming and hawing over, like, should I fly back on the 15th or the 18th? Oh, it's a $40 right. difference in ticket. Right. Okay, well, I'm going to make $40 <laughs> back. Yeah. You know, do I want to stay for a couple extra days? If I can see my friends beforehand, no, right? Like, what yeah. am I going to do then? Yeah. Right. Because, you know, even for me, the, the traveling has lost its glitter, mm. right? It's like, okay, if I don't know people there, I'm not doing something meaningful and purposeful there. Yeah. You don't know, I'll do what I want to do. I told my friends, I was like, man, I'll probably just spend a couple of days on the beach, just walk up and down, enjoy yeah. the sand, right? Maybe rent a surfboard. Right. Like, I have no interest in going to see Hollywood and right. whatnot. But, uh, so that was the first step. It's like, why am I hemming and hawing over such small purchases? The second was, um, we were thinking about going to Vegas as well, just skipping over. Well, in Vegas, they have racetracks and you can rent Lamborghinis and Ferraris. Cool. Right. And it's like 300 bucks. And I looked at that at first. I was like, oh man, $300. Like, I was like, wait a minute. No, no. How fun would it be just Wouldn't to rip yeah. around a Lamborghini <laughs> on a track? <laughs> be wild. You know, cause like. People who have own Lamborghinis, great. How often do you take them out? Yeah. How often do you actually push that machine to what it's supposed to do? Yeah. If you do, it's illegal. Yeah, exactly. If you hurt yourself, you could easily die. You could easily lose your license. Yeah. So many problems can come up doing that on the street. Right. And you're probably if you're making time to do it anyways. Right. You know? and, and and you know, the second you hit a pothole going anything upwards of sixty. Yeah. Like if you're going two forty in a Lamborghini, you hit a pothole, yeah. you might flip that car. Yeah or ruin the entire <laughs> yeah. exterior, yeah. right? Yeah, you're not doing that. So to be able to say, okay, well, I love cars. Sure. I, love going, I love going fast a little too much. Would I pay $300 for, the, for some other person, some other company to have the trouble of owning the Lamborghini, right, maintaining exactly. it, insuring it, and providing a space where I can drive on a smooth track? In a safe way. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, right? leave your half a million and go, you yeah, know, spend you your $300 right? and go get the thrill that you want. Honestly, and if you had Lamborghini money, yeah. like you could actually just go and do that once yeah. a week, every yeah. week of the year. Yeah, but I bet you don't. No. Exactly. You right. Your, you, it, it's going to cost you more just in insurance. You know what I mean? It's going to cost you more in gas than than what you're paying for that. If, you know, you can go get the let same let thrill. Let alone the, the headache that comes with owning that that, right, that exactly. can't be quantified. No, and the worry about every, like we were talking about yesterday, you worry about every rock chip and every everything. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but you don't get the prestige of owning a Lamborghini. If you're okay with that, you know, you can still, 
it's not like you can't still get the the thrill because one of the things you mentioned was like your that I, I want to touch on is like when you talk about people that are really wealthy and how you see people that are really wealthy but that kind of wealth and those kinds of cars and you think oh it's just like they you know took, probably took advantage of um people with less money or and whatever else money. or they got lucky or, or they inherited it yeah. or whatever right and and i think it's a i think you do yourself a disservice in thinking that because you like put it on a pedestal as if you could never achieve that much money and maybe you don't want to achieve that much money but even if you want to achieve more money than where you're at that's i think a big part of that money psychology thing is if you associate money as like this um unachievable unattainable goal for yourself and, and you do you put it on that pedestal it's it's hard to get over that mental hurdle whereas like i think i you know there's a lot of studies done on if you associate money not so much as like this end goal thing but as just a byproduct of the service you offer what you do for other people right mm -hmm. if you don't think so much about going out and trying to make money you're not trying to make a million dollars right if you're if your goal is more oriented around what are you doing for other people? What value are you bringing to other people? Right. Mm -hmm. And if, and if you're trying to follow a passion, like follow, think about how you can do more for other people and the money will come. Mm -hmm. Like I really believe that the money will follow the value that you provide. So if you're starting a company or I don't care, even if you're working for another company, you want to make more money. Think about how you can make yourself more valuable, you know? And I think, that's one of those things where, you know, like in a lot of cases, okay, some people, wealthy people did inherit money and whatever else. But in a lot of cases, I think they're better than at their, or they become good at thinking about how do they add value. And so like, you know, there's some of those shows like the undercover billionaire where, you know, they just go and give themselves three months and with nothing, like basically do it all again. How much money could you make in a couple of months? Somebody that knows how to make money, somebody, to watch this somebody who knows how to create value, mm -hmm. you know, and they're not. So start with nothing. What could you do? And in a lot of cases, they'll, in three months, they'll build five, $6 million in wealth because they know how to create value for people, mm -hmm. you know, and then the money follows. I just find it so fascinating because it's kind of like, okay, so what are they doing that's different? Mm -hmm. And so if you think about it that way, and it's not so much that money's the, the end goal, you're more thinking, well, how do you, how do you help people? help yeah. people and then like the money follow people get so I'll, I'll i'll add to that and kind of strengthen that perspective but first i'll say you know people really don't like jeff bezos because he's mm -hmm. very rich sure. my first question is well have you used amazon <laughs> exactly I have. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely i'll happily put more money <laughs> in his pocket so would i it's so convenient. i don't to leave my house you know like and you have three young children it's like hey we're stressed. We're both working. We got kids. We don't have time to get diapers. Amazon, one click, boom. And look diapers at the time it saves me. There's my half an hour in the evening that I don't have to run out to the grocery store because I can. Half an hour if you're, if you're efficient. If I'm fast, or it's like 45 minutes, you know, I don't have that much time exactly with my family. So to me, or like getting groceries delivered or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, or, or click and collect or those kinds of things where, okay, what's that worth? What's that time worth? And, and that's essentially those services that scale up. Yeah, that's what they're doing. They're they're maximizing value to the customer. Yeah. Um, so what I'll say to add on to what you had said, um, the first is so I had a, I mean Trent and I, my friend, talked not too long ago, and he he warned me about the way I think about rich people as well, mm -hmm. or just the way you think about money. It's like not to have that emotional attachment to it that it's good or bad. It's just right. it's just money. It just it right. And he was saying that you know. If you think of money as, as this bad thing, you're likely not going to get it. Right. Right. You're probably going to stay poor. And if you don't believe that, really think about that. Like, if you truly think money is a horrible thing, mm -hmm. you're likely going to stay poor because then you wouldn't want to be part of that as the perceived, you know, exploitation class. Like, oh, I don't yes. want to be part of those people who exploit. Yes. And understanding that most wealthy people don't exploit anyone other than themselves, really. Like, okay, I'm just going to work more. Yes. Right? Yes, most exactly. Um, so understanding, like, what do you really think of wealth? Like, do you think money is a bad thing inherently or yes. is it a good thing? Yes. Or, or, or is it just a tool? You know, it's just a tool. Exactly. And I think a lot of wealthy people just look at it as a tool. It's like, hey, money allows me to 
uh, you know, pay people to do this so I can focus on that. Right. right? Exactly. And go create more value. Yeah. Money and allows more me, people. Money allows me to have a, an epic vacation for two weeks. Right? right. And I don't have to think about it. Right. And then when they're back, then it's like, okay, well, how do I go help more people to make more right. money and whatever? Yes. Um, the other thing I'll add is, so I've been reading uh, Economic Facts and Fallacies by Thomas Sal. Okay. And he talks a little bit about these, these, so he, in part of his, one of his chapters, he talks about how people really whine about how much CEOs get paid. And they'll hear something like, oh, the CEO got a $12 million bonus and the company, like the employees at the bottom aren't getting paid more. And for a while in my life, I thought like, oh, that's kind of messed up. Like those people should be getting paid more. And then for a time I was like, you know, what? I don't really care. Like, it's, like I don't work in a corporation. So like, I don't really know what's going on. And then for the more recently, I was really, it's like, ah, you know, I understand CEOs work hard. Yeah. You know, I don't know what this guy's doing or girl. Yeah. I'm not the one giving the paycheck, like, that, like, yeah. you know? And so Thomas Al goes into that. He's like, the people who are quickest to complain about like the CEO getting paid $12 million might not realize that that CEO, the decision by the board to hire that person might have saved the company a hundred million dollars. Right. And so right. it's like, okay, the company has another extra $80 million, whatever it is. They pay this guy, guy or girl, $12 million. And people can cry about that all they want. But if he, if he or she hadn't come in and saved that money, all those people could be out of a job. Yeah, right. 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 And nobody's thinking about that. You know, though. and no, like, you know, and then depending on the company, that CEO's value might go into the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. Like, right. hey, you came in, you made choices, you, you cleaned things up, and now we're saving, you know, $500 million. Right. The company goes on. People have jobs. They have to yes. chat. Hire more people. Right? And Hire more, whatever they want to do. Right. It's yeah. really, you know, and then the other thing he talks about is that who the hell are you to say what they do in, with their company <laughs> yeah. and what they do with their hiring decisions, yeah. right? Like it's none of your business, right? This person's providing, like you said, providing a quantifiable amount of value. Another case study he gives is like, oh, people were quick to uh, get upset about the CEO who had clearly failed getting like a $20 million severance package. Please. Sir, pack up your bags and leave. We'll give you 20 mil cash today to do that. Right. And people are upset. Like, oh, well, I don't get paid $20 million to fail. It's like, yeah, but again, from the company's perspective, they probably don't want the company to get burned into the ground because of this person's decision. Right. You might as well pay him 20 mil, hire a different person. Move right? on. And so, you know, when, when we think about rich people and, and these kind of things, it's like there's likely a lot of information that we're missing. Yes. Right. Unless you exactly. yourself were a CEO, you were you, you created a company, you ran a company, you know, you played a very pivotal role in a company. You know, if you're just let's say a cog, mm -hmm. what do you know about the system? Yeah. Right? Yes. And you can be upset about being a cog, but you're not a cog, you're a human being. You know, yes. you can increase your your value, your contributions, you can figure out a way to become more effective and efficient. Mm -hmm. And and I think a more modern mindset to 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 grasp would be rather than hoping and praying to go all the way to the top in one company, see what other opportunities there are. Like do yeah. like a linear kind of zigzag. Like, okay, yeah. this company is offering me more. Okay, I'm going to go there. I'm going to do well there. And then I'm going to see, like, are they going to offer me more or whatever? Again, you know, if you're trying to get more and more money. And you might learn and learn a different skill, learn a different side of a business. And in, you're, you're, you know, you're creating value for yourself. You're making yourself more valuable to the next company too in doing that and not like you just want to be bouncing around all the time but yeah there definitely i agree there's there's a ton to be learned there and the other thing i, I have to touch on because you mentioned it was like when you talk about money seeing money is good or bad also i think seeing money is finite or infinite and you mentioned that because i think that's one thing where like not all in addition to seeing it as good or bad if you see money as like this finite thing like there's a certain amount of money in the world. Like there's this pie of money, you know, that's got to get divvied up between everybody and, and the wealthy just have this bigger piece and that just leaves less for everybody else. Again, I think that's doing yourself a disservice because that's not how money works. No. You know what I mean? Well, most people you, don't even know how money works. No, but like, exactly. If you look at a company that is becoming more valuable, right? You follow any company and you buy stocks and okay, it's becoming more valuable. That money, that value that it's creating, they didn't steal that from other companies. They created that value. They created that wealth 
by creating products that helped people, by doing things that people thought was valuable enough to spend their money on it. And so, you know, like by, again, by creating that value, you're creating wealth and the pie gets bigger like that. Your chunk of the pie doesn't have to stay the same size. It never does. It's always the pie can grow. So when you think about money and, you know, like your piece of it, think about it less is going and trying to earn your little sliver of the pie and think more about how can you make the pie bigger? Because mm -hmm. your piece will then get bigger. Make a better pie, right? How do you make right? a better pie? How do you, yeah, exactly. Yeah. A pie that somebody's going to want to go and spend their hard-earned money on. What are you doing? To do and, that. and maybe even thinking about it as a pie is wrong because a pie is finite. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. Unless you think but, about mathematical pie. Yeah, isn't well, it? <laughs> exactly. What can I do? But, but you know, make that make a pie bigger. Whatever it is, you know, like it, it can grow. Yeah. And so think focus on that. But it's a different again, it's a different way of thinking about money. It's a different money psychology in, in terms of So so I'll quickly speak to something you said there, and then I'll add to the value aspect. Mm -hmm. Um so so the first thing. You know, because let's say you do the thorough analysis of exploitation, you follow it all the way down. Oh, but Mr. Murphy, like that company, sure, they're creating valuable products, but who made those products? Workers are being exploited. Sure. Okay. There is a book out there. I forget what it's called, but th this guy writes this book about how s sweatshops are actually necessary. Mm -hmm. Because you got to ask, well, what existed there before that economically? What opportunities did they have before the sweatshop? Mm -hmm. And if you look at things as a progression, it's very, it's very convenient for us to say in Canada and America and Europe and in the West, well, you should have high quality living standards, work standards and pay. Okay, but 200 years ago, what did we have of that? None. You know, mm -hmm. you got to learn to crawl before you can walk. You got to learn to walk before you can run. You know, there's a progression. Mm -hmm. And... If you did boil it down, so even like, you know, I, I commonly talk about Teslas. Yeah. So the batteries that Teslas use, a lot of electric cars use, the minerals are taken from mines in yeah. Africa where they don't have a lot of good, any pay conditions, working conditions, human rights. Right. Um, and so, you know, just understanding the role that like, okay, we, we're not you know, if you have the mindset, the money is infinite, ideally Africa doesn't stay that way forever. You know, ideally the, the, these uh, less fortunate parts of the world can slowly move up and, you know, understanding what allows a society to continue to develop more value and move itself up. But you really got to wonder at some points, what is the alternative? You know, they're going to work. They want to work because they want to live better lives. Hmm. Well, what can they do in their environment, in their sphere of influence that people find valuable? It might be digging up minerals. It might be making Nike shoes and shirts and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy for us to just proselytize and say like, well, that's horrible. Okay, but then go live their life. Yeah. Like, what did they have other than that? You know, it's not as if they're being rounded together like collected by the nike yeah factory owners and being forced to work there yeah yeah and, and, and right that's interesting that's an interesting point and not to say that you know they shouldn't be entitled to the same quality of living and you know that we are i i, I think ideally but how do you take somewhere that that has no infrastructure and then get it to right and all of a sudden where, you know, where things are so where yeah, things are so just... expected and understood right like we we kind of know well you, you don't steal from people Right. You don't yeah. kill other people. I mean, and these are moral kind of ethical things, but mm -hmm. you know, we have this expectation when I twist a tap, the water comes yeah. out and it's clean. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it is. in many parts of the world, that's not the case. For sure. Right? It's good. And, and so understanding that there is a progression to these things. You can't just go from zero to a hundred. Right. Right. No matter or how many right. times Drake says song, whoever made this song, like <laughs> yeah. there is a progression. Yeah. Right. Um, and that kind of needs to occur. And so you can definitely, I, I don't know, I, I'm sure you can do something to make companies more aware that, hey, you, you know, you should seek to have better practices. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we should encourage other societies to have better practices as well and treat people more humanely. Yes. 
but understanding that, you know, it didn't occur just like that, even Correct. in our society, yeah, right? We, true. We, we were born into a society where we have that, but yeah, our ancestors weren't. Yeah. Right? And so that's an important thing as well when looking at like, hey, you know, the, the, the company is attempting to create a value and that's how they got their revenue, their right. money. Um, what was I going to say about the pie? Should we say something about the value? Oh, I don't know. I don't right. remember anymore. Okay. But yeah, I, I think regardless on that note, you know, if you're providing value, you can always, you know, I always ex give this example in my social studies class that if you're, if you're part of a group project and you do nothing, like you didn't add value, how many of you want that person? Right. Nobody raises yeah. their hand, right? Yeah. Uh, how many of you want to work, like how many of you would want to work with a hypothetical student that you know always gets 90 plus and right. they work hard? A lot of hands go up. Sure. Right. And quite frankly, it really is that simple. Yeah. Right? Which one are you? Would, you know, right. And not everyone's going to give that much value. No. But are you contributing? Are you yeah. adding to it? Or are you taking away? Exactly. Right? It's not all about just the mark either, you know, because there's lots of different ways to contribute. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great example, you know, in the classroom. And Oh, I, I remembered with the value in, in oh, yeah. the classroom, right? So. So one thing we've discussed before, and maybe not so much on, on video, but no matter how much value I add to my classroom, it's not going to change how much I get paid. I don't get a bonus. I don't yeah. get anything. But that's the wrong way to look at it. Like if my classroom's fun and enjoyable, like yeah. well, I'm there every day. Right. Right. And yes. So my days are fun and enjoyable. Yes. Um, all the better if kids leave with a better understanding of how to write. Because mm -hmm. that's particularly useful for my course yeah. than when they arrived. Right. And so taking the time to systematize things and figure out ways that I can increase the value of my class mm -hmm. and potentially free up more of my time. Right. right. So with the with the peer-to-peer -peer marking, it's like you really do need to write a lot. You know, me me, Miss KJ were just talking about this, you know, kids complaining about how, like, oh, well, my writing marks are bad. It's like, okay, you play sport. Yeah, how, how many hours do you spend a week playing sport? Maybe 10, 15, 20, depending on mm -hmm. if you're on a team. Yeah. How many hours do you spend writing? None. Okay, well, you need right. repetitions, right? <laughs> yeah. You don't, you don't pick up yeah. a dumbbell once and walk, leave the gym looking like Arnie. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, so That's a great point. You know, you're not going to write one essay and then people are going to save that essay and teach it to kids 200 right. years later. Like, hey, you were the Shakespeare of this time, yeah. right? Um, right. And so figuring out well, what actually provides value to students that can be kind of arranged through the curriculum or curricular needs. Yeah. You know, so I don't get fired. <laughs> well, there is that. I'm not doing there my is job. that. <laughs> That's but a great point, though. But if I increase the value provided in my class, one, you know, kids in it are hopefully going to be more pleasant. Yeah. Right. You might see a reason to be there and enjoy that. And mm -hmm. might be a little bit more compliant when I need them to be, as we were discussing yeah, yesterday. Yeah, for sure. Um, generally speaking, you know, the people in that room are going to be happy to see me. Mm -hmm. And if I see them outside in public, e even better, right? Like, yeah. hey, we're happy to see one another. There's really no quantifiable number for what that's worth. Yeah. Right. When people are just happy to see you. Yeah. And they feel good about it. Yeah. You know, and it's, I can't put a number to that. No, I agree. I feel the same way. It's a different kind of value, different kind of wealth, but you know. Right. And counts. so, so considering coming back to money psychology and the psychology of wealth, really think, well, what is wealth to you? That's right? a good, you point. know, like one thing Jordan Peterson talked about, you know, it's like wealth could be how your partner greets you the moment you walk in through the door or if they greet you really. Yes. Right. Yes. Like that's wealth as well. Yeah. Right? Like you have children, right. Yeah. You know, they, they, I'm sure they, they're excited to see you. When yeah. You it's, get the best, home. it's one of the best parts of my day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, wealth could be if you're respected. If if you're appreciated, if people value what you have to say, right. there's there's a, now again all of this sits on the foundation of like, are you making enough money to yes, survive? Exactly. Right? And then I think that should be fully yes. like understood. Yeah. We're not talking about you know, you're homeless. Yes, agreed. But uh, absolutely. But if like any general average person, you know, you're working and you're being diligent with your money yeah. and living within your means. After that, it's like you really got to ask yourself, well, what do I value? Yes. So my friend Trent, like he values having free time, right? Time to himself and values having, you know, six, eight hours just to learn, listen, whatever, do whatever he wants. So he's created a lifestyle that 
he can do that, right? Yeah. Is he the richest guy, like money wise? No. Will he be? I don't know, right? But his, mm -hmm. his goals are quite fascinating. Um, talking to him is very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whereas you could be sitting with a rich person or, or someone you think is rich and, and they're just miserable. Yeah. Right. And, and boring. And, and boring, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, no, really. You know, and then, and then, so I just finished reading that book, uh, Tuesdays with Maury. Oh, you did? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and and Mandy got it for me a couple of days ago and I, and I went right through it. through it. Really good book. You should you should all read. Yeah, it is. Really Tuesdays good. with Maury by Mitch Album. Yeah. It's definitely going on to my top shelf. It should be yes, valued books. Yes. But you know, he did talk about how, like, just this. Like, you know, none of us have neither of us have our phone here. We're yeah. Just listening. Um, and in the book, he really emphasizes like the relationships, the value of those relationships, that money simply cannot get you. Like having $10 million isn't going to make the relationship with your brother, your sister, or your parents better. Might make it worse, right? Yes. Because of whatever's it's going on. The nature of it, yeah. Um, and so coming back to the psychology of what you actually value is so important, yeah. right? Like how much, and we could even shift this over to, you know, how much money can you handle, right? Yeah. Like how much money do you need to feel financially comfortable? It's part of why a lot of people suffer is they're not financially comfortable. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't realize how little money they do need yeah. and how quickly they can put that together, right? Yeah. Like maybe you need, you know, you got a family, you got a house, maybe you need $25,000 on the side for a six month reserve in case you lose your job. Yeah. That could be done in three years. Sure. Easy. Depend well, depending on how you make, how much you make, but. Right. And give the, yourself some security, some buffer. You know, the freedom that that gives you, like, like I have a, I have a safety net of money as well. Mm -hmm. and so it makes my job super easy. You know, I can just tell people exactly what I think. Yes. If I lose my job, it's like, okay, I got a couple of months where I won't be on the street. Right? <laughs> I'll yeah, probably get a job in between. And that, I mean, that you made this comment earlier and a lot of wealthy people make this comment. Like you're really free to be who you are when you're financially free. Right. So you don't need a million dollars to be financially free. No, you know, so too. Um, as long as you're, let's say, employable, mm -hmm. you know how to, provide value and make money. Yeah. You don't need a whole lot. And being financially free allows me to be, you know, the most me version of myself. Right. Which is great, right? Like I really don't want to hold back who I am. I don't want to be reserved too much. You know, obviously there's a time for um uh I forget the word, but just being mindful of the situation sure. and holding yeah, back. But exactly everything generally is speaking. Like for me, that's what money allows me to do. Like, right. okay, like if I'm in a workplace and I know that I'm financially secure, you know, I can be myself. And if I get fired, that's okay. Right. Right. At least while I was there, I was enjoying myself. Well, and, and it's not that you couldn't spend all this other time and build all this other wealth, but if, you know, that doesn't allow you to mm -hmm. achieve your goal of being able to be financially free and stable and you know be who you are then then why it's like you say you know i get home and like the kids are excited to see me they don't care how much money i made you know as long as we still have food and house and whatever like they they just want me there mm -hmm. you know what i mean and and like it's even any relationship it's like you have to pay into that relationship you can't just bank on it otherwise one day it just won't be there and the reality is the kids they, they just don't care how much i make so yeah you know or, you know like, <laughs> yeah. and, and, like and, and again with that basic, uh, the needs met with your needs met. Right. Yeah. But like what you said, you can't pay into relationships, you know, it's like, so my family is never into gift giving, right. It's just mm -hmm. my culturally, right. Like, yeah, it's kind of for whatever reason, we just never really got into like birthday gifts. We don't celebrate Christmas Eve. You don't really give a gift. Mm -hmm. Um, and so as an adult, and then, you know, having a more diversified group of friends, it's like, I feel really awkward at birthday parties because it's mm. like, well, what do I do? Like, do I bring a gift? Now, my right. Brazilian friends, I know them well, and I know their values well enough. So on their birthdays, I bring them usually like a, a bag of coffee beans because right. I know they love coffee and right. I know they're going to use that. Right? Yes. Like, um, one year, you know, so my friend Theo really likes coffee, Marina as well, his wife. Yeah. Um, but one year, you know, Marina was really reading a lot of books. So I got her an Amazon gift card. Nice, I said, yeah. Hey, I don't know what book you want to read, but get yourself a book. Yeah. Right. What, whatever you want to do with it. Um, and so, you know, just buying a nice gift, like, oh, I'm going to get this person a nice expensive watch and they're going to love me. It's like, that's a covert contract. Yeah. Right. It's uh, true. And, you know, 
<laughs> you know, you're going to give them that expensive thing. It's like, you know, maybe that person doesn't value that. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, like I have my one watch kids, kids always compliment, like, Oh, it's such a nice watch. Like, yeah. And, you know, they're probably thinking like, Oh, it must be, it must have been expensive. Well, like, no, man, this is like a $40 watch off <laughs> of Amazon. Yeah. Right. Like don't even know what this company is. B U R E I. Like it's a knockoff <laughs> company. Right. Like, yeah. I don't know. Looks nice. Yeah. It I'll, does look nice. I'll time to see. Right. Like Jay-Z's uh, $500,000 astronomical wristwatch right. tells the same time that this one does. Right? Exactly. Uh, and I'm not worried about getting shot, stabbed, or kidnapped right. because I'm there to steal it. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's you know, something. Um, and so you can't really buy into relationships just with money. It's like you, you have to buy into them with love, attention, care. Time. Time, right? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. Do you want to speak a little bit, because you worked on some construction sites. Mm -hmm. You worked probably with a lot of construction workers. Yeah. Um, not to say that they're bad at spending money, but uh, do you want to speak to just how you've observed people spending their money? Because yeah. you've also been around executives and, sure. not, yeah. and other you know top-level managers. Yeah. And you know what? I find people's, I don't know, it is just my kind of experience, but again, I've really found that it doesn't matter if you're making $40,000 a year or you're making $400,000 a year. It doesn't make you any better at managing your money. I've seen people who make $40,000 a year, I was making $40,000 a year, and could be really smart with your money. Again, you're spending less than you make, you're making smart financial decisions, and you're living within your means, and, and you're happy. And I've, and I've seen people make $40,000 and spend you know way more than that. Same with $400,000. People, you know, still spending, you think, how can you spend $400,000 in a year? It's easy. Yeah. Like, it's easy. <laughs> yeah. And and so, like, you know, people are just people. Like, human nature is human nature. And I think I would say, like, go educate yourself. You know, like, you want to go learn about money? Go start reading, like, some of those books you mentioned. You know, like, The Richest Man in Babylon or, or that one that you mentioned about your money or your, your life. money or your life or whatever. Which, which does go into like, hey, do you want to make a lot of money or do you want to have a life? Right. Kind of, kind of. Kind yeah. Of, right. I mean, those are good. Those are good. Back to economics. Right. Back right? to economics. Is can you can be a new, new car? No. Yes. Right? no. Exactly. Go start educating yourself because I don't care how much money you make. You, you might, you know, because again, if you put yourself in that position where you think like, oh, I only make, you know, thirty four forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year. It's not really worth it for me to go learn about money because I'm not making enough money to make a difference anyways. No, like, that's again, the wrong that's a mindset. Poor, that's a poor person way of thinking. You yeah. know, like Rich Dad, Poor Dad is another good book. Or, you know, there's um, Millionaire Teacher, or like that's more about on the investing side. But th there's just so many that you can just go and start learning about money. And it might change your perspective about money. And it might change how you see it. And it might change your perception. And, and then that can change how... Th that, I think, is really an important way of how you're going to change your lifestyle, change your wealth is, is by learning about it. And, and it's really important with these things that are more abstract and not physical, right? So, so like, you, know, you can stand naked in front of a mirror and see where you're either lacking or need more of, right? You know, like if you're really large, let's say obese, you look at yourself in the mirror, it's very obvious, like, okay, like there's a problem here, mm -hmm. right? Like, Okay, maybe I need to do some about my exercise, my diet, so that I have better health and right. I have more longevity, right? You know, things like relationships, the way you perceive yourself in a relationship and behave and money and whatnot and psychology, more of the brain stuff, you can't see that. No. And so another reason to read the books, even if you think reading books is stupid, is just to see, like, what are other people thinking about yes. this subject? Yes. Right? Like, you know, yes. you're, if you're in a relationship, sometimes your partner will point out things that you do or the ways that you behave, right? Yeah. You know, like maybe, maybe maybe someone who says sorry a lot and it's like, hey, what's going on? Like, what's happening here? Why? Because I don't, like, I don't feel like you need to say sorry for this. It's, it was out of both of our control. Yeah. And I'm not upset. Yeah. Like, I hope I don't look that way. And then you, you, you discuss that with them and they go like, hey, you know, when you say it to me, that deficiency becomes so much more apparent. Mm -hmm. okay, you read a book and they say, they say, hey, you know, 10%, 30% of your income monthly paycheck should be put aside. Mm. Wait, wait, wait. We're breaking our income up into percentages? I didn't know that. Why, yeah, Why are we doing that? that? Like, what's going on here? Yes. And then maybe you start looking around like, hey, man, like, how much money do you save? Like, what percentage do you put aside? And, you know, it, it addresses a deficiency that. Yes. Because 
Like how many of us, our parents were good with money. Right. right? Um, or talked about money. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? right? Because if you're not having a conversation about it and you might be in a relationship where, you know, like you say, if you grew up in a family that didn't talk about money and then how are you supposed to break the mold and, and start a conversation about it and change the way you see it if you're not able to talk about it and maybe not even with your spouse, but like there's lots of people that that's what they do. Lots of resources. Yeah. Like it's in. not a taboo, right? You can no. absolutely have that conversation. Sure. Right. And, and you know, sometimes it's tricky. You get into an environment where people are very like reserved right. about money yeah. and, and what to do and whatnot. But, then you know like at that, that point it's like leadership of your own life it's yeah like, okay you just gotta be like kobe bryant you know there's a quote from kobe bryant he's like i'm the type of guy who will tell you when you have a piece of food stuck between your teeth because right. i would rather have the 15 seconds of discomfort yeah and let you leave that day knowing like okay well i don't have food in my teeth and right you know, kobe was the one who told me that i don't right? yeah well, so now i don't have That's to look like an idiot yeah <laughs> you know i've asked questions about my um like our benefits as a teacher, I've asked questions about taking days off that nobody bought, like no one's going to tell me, no, you know, and that, that, that wisdom isn't just going to magically arrive into my brain no. one day and I'm going to know what to do. Like I have to ask people. Yeah. Right. And that's because okay. like, there's, there was a couple of days this year. I should have taken a sick day and mm -hmm. I didn't because I had no idea how sick days were. I didn't right. know I had 20 of them. No questions just, asked. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, right? it is. Like there were days I was miserable and like any of the grade nines watching this or. or kids, <laughs> they know, you know what you're talking about. Like, <laughs> yeah. There are days where it's like, like I just start talking and like two minutes later, it's like, oh, I got to sit. Right. Like, I, like, I didn't be there. No, not at all. Right. But I didn't know. Right. Yeah. So having that question of ignoring what like oh well what are people going to think of me when i ask this question right. you know, if i ask like hey you know like how much money do you save every month yeah. you know i'm just curious like, what are they going to think of me they're going to think like oh this guy doesn't know anything about money he's an idiot doesn't want right. to spend probably and, not and in our previous conversations like you might stumble into a mentor yes someone who's going to help 100%. you not just with money but with a lot of things yes but, but you know, potentially money. If you keep asking the question of like, yeah. Hey, like how much money do you save? Like, right. how do you, how did you make sure you had enough money for, to pay for your children's education? Like, how do you manage your bills? Like, what yeah. do you do? Right. Yeah. Um, you might learn things you don't want to know about people, right? Like some people might, <laughs> you might lose respect for them, but, yeah. but, uh, um, then you'll know that, you know, I'm comfortable with that information. Yeah. That, and you know what, the, right? one of the last things I'll say is, um, you know, you, some of those books we mentioned are pretty like, financy you know and it, okay maybe that's not for everybody you don't want to go and read 200 pages of a finance book but the other place i get a lot of information from is is from autobiographies and biographies of wealthy people i find them just fascinating i've never considered doing that. no because if you will follow somebody like i've read jeff bezos and and uh, uh what's his name from nike uh the book's called shoe dog or uh or Elon Musk, like Elon Musk, I found fascinating. Now that was a biography that wasn't his autobiography. I don't think he's written an autobiography, but his biography, I found it fascinating, his relationship with money. To him, like his and his relationship with risk and risk-taking is beyond anything I could imagine. Like that guy's willing to take on more risk because to him, you know, he'd risk it all because to him, he could just build it back, mm -hmm. like honestly. You know, like the number of times that SpaceX was like on the brink and they were down to like their very last launch, you know, because like, they had lost so many rockets that were exploding and, and they were down to, I mean, they were down to like, they had enough money, like they scraped together enough money to do one last launch. This is it. That's it. Like you have all your eggs in there. Everybody that gets fired. Everybody everybody, goes everybody's going home. Otherwise, it, it, you know, if that thing blows up again, like the last 10 have, but then they made it. You know, and then, you know, look at them now. And it's kind of like, wow, that's so interesting. I don't think I could have ever done that. But what an interesting relationship with risk because, and the way he sees money, again, he doesn't see it as something finite. It's like, oh, I can go build it back again. You know, worst case, whatever, you go bankrupt, you're going to build it back again. Wow, yeah, what an John interesting, flip yes, burgers, right? yes, what an interesting perspective of one of the richest, you know, people in the world, how they see money and like, how do you kind of now... I think about that all the time when I think about risk and I'm very risk averse, but I always think about that and wow, is this something that I really need to like shy away from just because I'm taking on a little risk or what's the worst that's really going to happen, you know? 
And some of those books have really given me some perspective on things like that. I find it really fascinating. And I started teaching that to my students this year because I learned more about it earlier this year. But everyone has a different stomach for risk. Yeah. And people don't understand how much of a role that plays and how much money you make. Absolutely. Right? Like teaching is a risk-free job. Yeah. That's simple. Mm-hmm. And that's why, you know, it'll cap. Yeah. Right. A particular place. Um amongst other things I could say but won't on camera. You know, teaching is not a very risk uh, risky job. No. Uh, neither is, you know, being a nurse or no. a doctor. To work be for honest, the government right? or uh, yeah. work for the government. You know, these are not risky jobs. Entrepreneurship is risky. Yeah. Um you know, like there are few careers that are risky. Entrepreneurship as a class of things you could do is very mm-hmm. risky, but you know, high risk, high reward. The high right? upside, yeah. And people don't want to, people aren't really aren't even aware of this conversation that like, Hey, everyone has their own threshold for risk. It's not clear where that comes from. It could be genetic. It could be biological. It could be environmental, Yeah. but some people are willing to literally risk everything. Yes. Right. It, you might think you might look at them as deficient. So there's this guy I like on, on, here's how that phrase connects. So there's this guy on YouTube, I really like Jesse James West, I think his name okay. is. He's a fitness YouTuber, right? But uh, another guy really like uh, Derek from More Plates, More Dates. Mm-hmm. I think it was him who was saying, he's like, he's like, people need to understand that his success comes from the fact that he simply has no social anxiety or fear. You know, and like this guy, I haven't, I don't, like I watched a couple of videos of him working out with, you know, Half Thor Bjornsson, World's Strongest yeah, Man. But yeah. like, he also has these videos like titled, Asking Hot Girls at the Beach, questions you're too afraid to and, and you know what this guy Derek was saying is like he'll walk up to anyone and just start a conversation right there's, there's no fear of it well wow. how many other people do you know who can do that walk up to the most gorgeous girl in the room and just ask her a question about her dating life or other right. things it's like you know and and so he'll make content where I guess he'll just wander up to people strangers and just ask them questions and just interact with them yeah right well that's fascinating content people Isn't want to it? see that yeah right? imagine what you could learn yeah. Right. You know, and this is guy, it, his, his page is blown up over the last few years. Right. He's mm-hmm. a very successful YouTuber. Right. And, and he makes great content as yeah. well. Right. Like I, like his workout videos with half Thor are really funny. Yeah. Like, you have this like mount, the guy who's literally nicknamed the, the mountain, mountain in the yeah. show. <laughs> yeah. And then you have another guy who's like very strong and fit, but it's just different levels. It's right. ridiculous. Um, you know, but even doing something like YouTubing, it's quite risky. Right. right. Sam, like Mr. Beast talks about that. He's like, yeah. Uh, I saw this little clip of him recently and he's talking about like he was a kid. He's like, I don't care what happens to me. Like, I'm going to YouTube. Like, I don't right. care if I'm broke. I don't care if I'm on the street. Like, this is what I yeah. want to do. I'm going to do it. I'm going to figure it out. Yeah. And, and when you and when you watch the videos about how long it took him, mm-hmm. like how long he was at it making videos before anybody knew who he was or start catching on. It was a long, like your years, you know, you put years into making videos and learning the craft and stuff. But nobody thinks about that. It's kind of like, oh, this guy built all this wealth. And look how great he did. And, you know, like, right time, right place. But it's like you, you're you missing all the work he put in before. Right. That. I was listening to a podcast with Alex Hermosi and Zuby. And so Alex Hermosi is a businessman, quite wealthy. Zuby is a British rapper and entrepreneur, amongst other things. But, uh, you know, they were both talking about that. It's like, man, you could be in your garage for 10 years. And on year 11, people would be saying, Oh, I wish I was lucky like you. Exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> you that's know, it. so so that's another part of like a lot of people who built wealth, like, well, how long were they grinding in yes. a in a in a hellhole before <laughs> anyone knew who they were, before right. anyone cared, right? Like Jeff Bezos, nobody knew who he was for years. Yes. Right? All of a sudden, like his company really blows up, whatever, whatever happened that took him from being just uber rich to like inconceivably rich. Yeah, and he's like you look at his first business which was selling like books by mail order, you know, like you talk about like starting off small fries. It's like, it, it didn't, it wasn't just Amazon on day one. Yeah. And so you, you can't <laughs> yeah, just, it ignore, wasn't a, you can't, a, it wasn't a giant just corporate building. Yeah, you can't just ignore the fact that, you know, there's all every, they were all on this journey that got there. And, and, but again, you look at like their habits and their, you know, the ways, their their philosophy with money and you could learn a lot from that because you look at how they tried to create value they're yeah. trying to, they're trying to help people try and create value and yeah 
What were some shifts of money psychology you had? I, I mentioned one of mine, like just really getting comfortable investing into myself. Yeah. But after buying that jacket, it was a spree. Like right. I like I like I bought I, I don't know what I I might have bought some nice shirts prior to that or after, but then it was basically spending like almost 10 grand on wardrobe, right. maybe up to 15 now. Um buying, you know, two thousand dollars worth of books, taking different courses and whatnot. Um yeah. You know, and just getting comfortable with like, hey, I'm spending this money to make myself better. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm slowly now starting to peruse through more and more of those books. Mm -hmm. A lot, a lot I just won't look at. Yeah. Whatever, you know, that's part of buying a lottery ticket, right? Yes. Most of them don't win. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but for me, that was a huge shift. And that happened like maybe three years ago, um, which, you know, coincided with me getting a professional job as well and having more yeah. money to begin with, right? Um, I think I'm currently experiencing another one where I, I just stopped hemming and hawing over small amounts of money. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, like I'm going to go to California, meet some friends. I've never been to California, to LA before. So what if I spend a couple, three to $500 extra, like whatever. Right. 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 Who cares? Yes. Um, so those are kind of two real big shifts for me, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm curious, what are some money shifts for you? Uh, the, the spending, investing in yourself is a, is a big one. And like, I'm, uh, self-admittedly pretty, well, you could say cheap or thrifty or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm pretty frugal, I guess, when it comes to spending money and stuff. But then I've also kind of had to come to the realization of, you know, like being okay with spending money, kind of like you said, sometimes on yourself and sometimes just on like those experiences and stuff and deciding what you want to spend money on and and again, like for me, it kind of helped to have a bit of a budget where you can, you know, you're setting aside a certain amount of money and, and then, you know, you're paying off things that need to be paid off. But then, you know, that being okay with spending money on those other things too, like, you know, you get left over with a certain amount of money at the end of the month. Well, that that's okay to spend that, you know, it's okay to go and go on the trips and do the things because like you work hard. And so you want to enjoy that as well. Mm -hmm. Like, and for me, it's, you know, we were talking, okay, I'm going to do a bit of a reno on our house. And it's kind of like, okay, well, we've put that off for quite a few years because it's kind of like, well, in some ways it is, it's good enough. And, you know, it's, it's fine, but we're also, okay, we're planning on living there for the next 20, 30 years, probably, okay. you know, I like guess just a house that we, so to us, there's, okay, we, you may get some of the value back out of it. You potentially, you know, in time you put money into your house, maybe that's something you get the value back out of, but for us, that's not really a, it. It's that, this is a something kind of like your clothes you wear. You know, it's like this is something I spend a lot of time in. It's and and make to your me, house beautiful. You want right? to make your house nice, and you can do that without spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on it too. You know, like you can paint and you can put a new floor, put a new taps or boss, whatever. But like those things, that also changes how you feel because you spend a lot of time in your house, and so you know if it's a place that you enjoy being and that you can then you know focus less on you know, every wall ding and you can be more present. And there, there's something to be said for that too. Like wearing nice clothes, if it makes you feel, it makes you feel different. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I guess in terms of like a money shift for me, it was being okay with spending money on some of those things that, okay, maybe they're not going to create big value long-term. Like, yeah, you want to invest it with some of your money, but on some of your money it's for spending and that's okay because you don't know you're going to be here tomorrow and you can save it all till the end. But at the same time, you want those experiences and be able to go you, on a trip. Your end might come 20 years sooner 100%. than you thought it would. Yes. And so at that point, I don't want to have been putting off all the trips with my family and all the memories. And when you do go on those trips, to not feel guilty, you know, kind of like you say, not be like agonizing over every $20 thing you have to buy. And oh, it's like, now I got to pay for my, you know, check my luggage. That's another 50 bucks. And like, you know, you could just mm -hmm. be like tormenting yourself the whole trip. Yeah. Or you can just accept the fact that, you know what, it costs money to, to go on a trip and make memories and, and that's okay. And so, you know what, it is. I'm kind really of what looking is. forward to seeing these yes, friends. You exactly. Know, I, I haven't seen them in years. And it's going to cost money. And that's just, that's what money's for. And you know what, you can earn more and enjoy it. So mm -hmm. that's kind of been a bit of a shift. Would you agree that the essence of that is kind of detaching emotion yeah. from money? A little bit. Yeah. Right. You know, and even like, with what you said about the clothes or whatever it is that makes you feel good. You know, there's like this stoic idea that like, Hey, maybe one day out of the week or like a couple of days out of the month, 
sleep on the floor, wear crappy clothes, eat beans and rice. I, I, I think I think it was Ryan Holiday or Tim Ferriss, whatever. But it's still like ideas, Ferriss, right? Yeah. It's like you know, just remind yourself, like you are who you are, right? right? Like doesn't matter what you wear. <laughs> you know, like if if you're like I, I like wearing suits and the blazers and whatnot. I like yeah. dressing well. It's enjoyable, mm-hmm. but I, I don't use it as like a as a smoke screen to be like, okay, well, if I'm wearing a suit jacket, people are going to think I'm good at my job. Right. Like, man, if you don't think I'm good at my job, like, all right, you're entitled to your opinion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to keep grinding away. Um, and so, you know, pulling away that emotion from that, because even um, I was, I was talking to a student, that, like I can't say their name, but um, him and I were discussing how like, Oh, you got to have a couple like, ugly clothes around just in case you got to do work around the house, yeah. backyard and whatnot. And I didn't tell him then, but something that I told my cousin who said the same thing is I showed up to his, his shop one afternoon to do an oil change, wearing like a blazer and like nice clothes. He's like, Oh man, like, let me do this for you. Like you're wearing nice clothes. And I was like, no man, like I bought these clothes. Like I- I'm okay if they get dirty and used. Yeah. Now, obviously I don't want motor oil on my jacket. I'm going to take that off, but yeah, but you know, like the other week, uh, I wore a new shirt, new something else. And that two days was like the most amount of food I've dropped on myself <laughs> in yeah. years. Like I spilled ice cream on my shirt. I got coffee on my pants. I got, I got a stain on my shorts the other day as well. Yeah. Or just really close by. I'm like, yeah. what is going on? <laughs> um, but detaching the emotion that like, sure, obviously if something goes horrible. That's different. Like tragedies are tragedies. Yeah. But, you know, like I, I wore my dress shirt, my suit and blazer to the dance and, you know, this thing got all sweaty. It, Right. Still got to take it to the yeah. to the dry. <laughs> Does sure. it smell bad? Over no, 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 no. But <laughs> you know, but like, I know what you mean. It's like, like, hey, like I bought this thing, not for it to look pretty on a rack right. somewhere, right? Like, yes. like I want it to look yeah. pretty on me. Yeah, I want to enjoy maybe you know fifty to hundred to two hundred fifty uses out of this thing that I have. Right. That I that I bought to improve the quality of my life. You know, and then, and then learning to not use that as a substitute for actual competence. Right. Right. It's like, hey, just because you're wearing a nice suit blazer doesn't mean women are going to walk up to you. It's like, you're no. still going to have to go and figure that out. Right. Yeah. Um, just because so you got a nice car doesn't mean your neighbor's going to respect you. They might actually hate you more. Yeah, right. Possible. Um, you know, and then it does come back to like the character, the values, uh, who you are as a person, but then getting comfortable, like removing the emotion from the money and saying, like, okay, yeah. like, you know, and I was going to make that comment that like, you know, life is like a cycle. It's like, okay, you're going up, you're working hard, you're working hard. There should be time for rest, relaxation, yeah. enjoyment, reflection. Yes, absolutely. And then a cycle back to working hard, right? Yes. But if you're just working hard, 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 just going, you're just going to fall off a cliff, yeah. right? And and you don't know that cliff might come sooner than you think. Yes, and exactly. So so for myself too, that shift of, you know, I, I, I finally started enjoying my money this year and going yeah. on little trips. I went to Vancouver met a friend there, went to Montreal, met another friend there. And while I'm there, it's like in Vancouver, I was a little bit more willing to spend money just because I didn't know the city as much mm-hmm. and was more curious. Montreal, I lived there before. So I was like, ah, I mean, the same enjoyments aren't there for me anymore. Yeah. Like I, I was very, I was 21 and right. you, know, you want to go out, you, you want to party, that. whatever. Now I was like, I don't really want to do that. Like right. I, I don't want to stay out late and like sleep until 2 p.m. tomorrow. Like, yeah. I, I just want to enjoy myself. Right. right. And so the experience there was very different, but not hemming and hawing over like what I'm going to do, yeah. how I'm going to spend my money. Right. right. And it's important to have your values sorted out. So every morning I'd go over to the Dollarama for breakfast and I'd get two muscle milks, right? Because it's oh, like, yeah. well, do I want to eat like a sandwich in the morning? Not really. I yeah. can't really cook. It's like, okay, well, I'm pretty accustomed to having protein shakes in the morning. Well, right. this muscle milk is close to a protein shake as I'm going to get. Yeah. Okay. Good enough. Right. Five bucks gets me through the day, gets me through like the next thing. I ate out a whole lot because I was like, well, like I'm not going to go to a grocery store and cook. Right. You know, and I'm just wandering out and about. Whatever. I'll just eat out. Right. Yeah. One week of bad eating won't kill me, hopefully. No. Right. No, exactly. Um, you just enjoy. And then knowing that, okay, one, I'm coming back to a job that gets me a paycheck. Two, I'm going back to a home that will have the quality of food that I like and the routine yeah. that I like. So just enjoy this time, right? Like you're here to meet some friends and and, and live a little and right. see Montreal in the winter. And, right. You know, that's a, it's a great point because as much as money is important to save and, you know, it's for spending too. Yeah, we'll end it on that. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.